Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the third session of the Introduction to Mindfulness course. And just to give those who are joining us tonight, uh, maybe later after um, the recording, I'd just like to uh, let you know that um, I've been a member of uh, Tubten Norbu Ling for several years now. And I'm currently working on an on FPMT teacher certification. So I've done a couple of uh, courses on minds and mental factors with Venerable George Chirinoff and on mindfulness with uh, Venerable Sangye Kadro. What I'll do is reference quotations uh, throughout this course and add my explanations where appropriate. But I would like to let you know that Tupta Norbu Ling has many excellent resources in terms of teachers. Any of the ordained faculty or lay teachers have great experience and in-depth knowledge. So I'll encourage you to consult with them if you have questions. Again, I would recommend if uh, you are having, if you are undertaking advanced practices or if you're having particular difficulties that maybe I haven't been able to address uh, to your satisfaction, I would recommend that you either go to, um, if you have a connection with Tubta Norbu Ling, that you um, go visit some of the teachers there or um, another FPMT center or, you know, someone that you've checked out and you trust. So this course here is intended to serve both Buddhists and non-Buddhists, but it's based on Buddhist concepts and perspectives. However, just personally, I feel that um, what I'm uh, trying to impart to you is of general interest and general benefit. And again, um, for any of the students in the class tonight, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them, how might this benefit me if maybe the, to the Buddhist perspective isn't really making sense to you? So beginning meditators are the target audience, but the nature of this particular material takes some technical explanation, which I'll try and keep as simple as possible. And then this will really help um, understand mindfulness and its context, in particular in Tibetan Buddhism. And so, as I said just a moment ago, you're encouraged to comment and ask questions to help clarify your understanding. Let's um, begin now with setting our motivation to try and bring positive energy to, uh, to this session tonight. And what we do in our motivation is we try as, as best we can to generate four vast positive attitudes. Even if these attitudes don't mean a lot to you, um, you can just think of them as an ex exercise in expanding your mind. And those four attitudes are benevolence, compassion, sympathetic joy in others, happiness and virtue, and impartiality in engaging with others. So may all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. And may all sentient beings Abide in equanimity, free from attachment to friends and hatred for enemies. Well, let's uh, begin this session with a meditation. So just uh, take your now familiar um, meditation posture. And uh, Jennifer, if you would, uh, I'll ask you just to mute your mic if you don't mind. And uh, I'll begin with a few words just to kind of get you settled in for this particular um, meditation. It's familiar. So you can just relax and uh, just get into the, um, the feeling of the class tonight. So it's general, generally preferable to practice meditation sitting on a cushion with your legs crossed. But if that is uncomfortable, you can sit on a chair, you can rest your back against the wall while you're seated on the floor, 
or lie down in the supine position that is on your back with your head resting on a pillow. Just experiment with all of these if you're having difficulty with seated meditation. And sometimes, maybe through illness, fatigue, whatever, we might want to change our meditation posture and maybe take advantage of lying down just so that we can continue to meditate and gain its benefits, even when our body is not ready for sitting meditation. However you decide to position yourself, just let your back be straight and settle your body with a sense of relaxation and ease. Your eyes can be closed, generally recommended if your brain is a little bit excited and energized. They can be hooded, that is partially closed, that's sort of the ideal, but can take some practice. Or just open. That's maybe if you're feeling like dull or sinking energy, you may want to keep your eyes open to gain the stimulus, visual stimulus to help elevate your mood. If you're sitting, just rest your hands on your knees or in your lap. Your head may be slightly inclined or directed straight ahead. And your tongue touches your palate lightly. Bring your awareness to the tactile sensations throughout your body from the soles of your feet up to the crown of your head. We do this just to make our mind more present. This is just a natural result of paying attention to the sensations of our body and reduces our tendency to think about the past or imagine the future. You can note sensations in your shoulders and neck. Those are places where a lot of us tend to hold tension. And if you detect any tightness there, just release it. Do the same with the muscles of your face, your jaw, temple, forehead, as well as your eyes. Just let your face relax like that of a sleeping baby and set your entire body at ease. We relax ourselves in this way, and then just remind ourselves to keep physically as still as we can. And what that means is just avoiding unnecessary movement And in doing so, we'll find that the stillness of the body helps to settle the mind. So those first two instructions are for relaxing the body and stabilizing the body. And then the third instruction is to assume a posture of vigilance. That's where you slightly raise your sternum so that when you inhale, you can feel the, the sensations of the respiration naturally go to your belly. This posture energizes the spine and helps keep your body upright. Now we'll begin the meditation itself after those preliminary words and just settle your respiration in its natural flow. Don't try to control it or change it, just let it be. Continue breathing through your nostrils, 
noting the sensations of respiration wherever they arise within your body. Observe the entire course of each in and out breath, noting whether it is long or short, deep or shallow, slow or fast. Let the body breathe as if you are fast asleep but stay mindfully vigilant of the breath. Thoughts are bound to arise involuntarily, and your attention may also be pulled away by noises and other stimuli from your environment. When you note that you have become distracted, instead of tightening up and forcing your attention back to the breath, simply let go of these thoughts and distractions. And then gently but firmly, return your attention to the breath. Especially with each out breath, Relax your body, release extraneous thoughts, and happily let your attention settle back into the body. With each exhalation, release involuntary thoughts as if they were dry leaves blown away by a soft breeze. Relax deeply through the entire course of the exhalation and continue to relax as the next breath flows in smoothly like the tide. Breathe so smoothly that you feel as if your body were being breathed by the air surrounding you. Well, that ends the uh, introductory meditation. Did anyone have any questions or comments? Maybe something you thought of over the last week or so. Maybe you're just so relaxed, you're just waiting for me to say my next thing. Jay! Well, I'm relaxed and waiting for you to say the next thing, but I do have a minor question. Of um, course. The, uh, 
one thing I've never understood. I, I, I am aware of the advice about leaving the eyes half closed or more than half closed. Right. Other than alertness, is there any other particular reason for that instruction? It, it stops yeah. you from closing off, but is there any other reason? That's what I've kind of wondered. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And how it goes is how well I'll tell you what I've heard. Um I can attribute it to his holiness, but um, I can't tell you exactly where I heard it. Um, but first, I'll explain for the other students, you're, you're pretty advanced, Jay. So you can use the eyes to control kind of the stimulus of the brain. So if your brain is sinking and dull, you might want to keep your eyes open to bring in more light. If your brain is overstimulated, you might want to close the eyes in order to, you know, um, reduce the visual stimulus that's coming in and then kind of relax a little bit. Ideally, the posture is recommended to be just keeping the eyes sort of hooded. But when you first try it, you might find your eyelids flickering. But that's ideal because light is coming in, but there's... All you can see is just the light. You can't see any kind of like visual images. So that keeps you from getting too distracted. Um, what I've heard is another reason is that for a Buddhist meditator, they keep the eyes half open as a symbolic, but also as a practical way of reminding themselves that Although they are meditating, they're meditating on the meditation cushion, the whole idea is to connect with the world outside. So you could think, you know, the top half, you know, with the closed part of your eyes is sort of an internal focus. And having the eyes slightly open allows you to not forget that the whole reason to be on the meditation cushion is to help you in the external world. And just in general, I mean, you know, whether you're Buddhist or not, um, that's also the, the point of meditation. Definitely, we want to have a relaxing, kind of, you know, enlightening experience on the cushion, but we also want to take the benefits off of the cushion. Okay. I hope that's, that... That's great. Yeah, no, that is great. That's really helpful, particularly because I am trying to integrate the concept of, um, in a sense, bringing meditation more into my life on a 24-7. Yeah, yeah, so that's cool. Thank you. Well, yeah, and the, you know, and you can experience, we're talking about the mental factors, the mental factors of mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Those don't just arise in meditation. You are using them all the time. And so having familiarity with them, and in particular, mindfulness, you know, being able to, you know, you learn in meditation to tune your mindfulness. You learn in meditation through the mental factor of introspective awareness that your mindfulness is not operating. But that can be used, you know, you're driving, you're at work, you're engaging with someone. You just practice it in meditation and use it off the cushion. All right. Well, um, again, I just mentioned mental factors. And just as a refresher, a mental factor is a component of the mind. And I just mentioned four of them for mental factors. Again, mindfulness, concentration, wisdom. Wisdom is not like a, a, always like a thunderbolt. You know, it's uh, sometimes just noticing something or learning about something that you're observing, maybe discriminating, judging the good points or negative points of that thing. And then I mentioned introspective awareness. So mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom all go together. Sometimes, you know, if you're working with a familiar object, it'll happen so fast that they all seem to like blend in or merge together. You just sort of focus on something, you're concentrated 
It's because it's familiar, you can concentrate quickly, and then you'll realize, observe, learn something about what you're looking at. So those three go together and we just break them apart to make it easier to talk about them. You know, start with the beginning, which is mindfulness so that we have a good foundation and then kind of move on from there. So that's mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. And then kind of the friend of mindfulness is introspective awareness. If we're mindful, everything is going well. We've got that elephant nicely trained and it's like lifting logs or carrying people around in safari. But the moment the elephant starts to get restive and out of control, that's when we notice through introspective awareness that process is beginning to happen. And then what we do is we reassert control over the elephant of the mind and then return it to the meditation object. So that's kind of a quick um, summary. Uh, and yeah. And so uh, Jennifer asked, asked a question, well, what's an example of that? It was, I'm glad she asked that question. And it could be something as simple as with breathing. So if you decided in meditation that you want to focus on your breathing, you set your attention on it, on the breath that is, and keep it there with mindfulness, just remembering that that's where you want to put your attention. And you know your mindfulness is working as long as the breath stays with the attention or vice versa, rather, the attention stays with the breath. So that's how you know mindfulness is working. And then kind of as a natural kind of process or evolution of just resting on the breath, you're gonna to begin to concentrate on it. It just takes up, you know, your whole, you know, mental apparatus because that's where you're looking metaphorically. And so naturally you pay more attention than your attention is fixed on the breath. And so you begin to concentrate on it and you begin really to access it. You engage with it more powerfully. It becomes more vivid in your mind, all different ways of saying the same thing. So that's concentration kicking in. And then just simple example, we might notice as we were instructed in the meditation we just had, we might notice the qualities of the breath. Like, is it, is our breath long or short? Does it seem natural to us? Is it, is it what the meditation leader said it should be? You know, is it getting more subtle or is it still rather coarse? All of those things are realizations that come through wisdom, just noticing aspects or characteristics of the breath. And so that's how those three go together. But as I just said, it can happen so fast that you don't really distinguish or discriminate between those stages. However, when we're in meditation and we'd like slowly and carefully set up our physical posture and our kind of mental posture, if you will, and calm our minds, we are able to slow things down a little bit and notice those separate stages of mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. What may well happen, and as certainly has happened to me, is you might get a little bit knocked off the meditation object, which is the breath, by those observations. This is totally natural. We're going to talk about this a little bit in this class. You then kind of get carried off noticing those things, thinking, oh, am I doing it? Am I breathing right? Um, is my breath too short? Is it too irregular? Is it too regular? Am I doing something wrong? And then so as soon as that starts happening, 
what you've lost your mindfulness of the breath. You've gotten carried away with the analysis, if you will, of your breath. And then you're not actually thinking about the breath anymore, but you're thinking about what should I be doing? Am I a bad person because I can't control my breath? Is there something wrong with my breath? You know, all of that stuff. So what happens is you catch yourself. So what am I doing? Why am I not meditating on the breath and instead like analyzing, you know, what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, you know, what's going on? Is there something wrong with my body? And so when you catch yourself, that's introspective awareness. It's like a lot of syllables, but all it, it is is noticing that something is not right, that the mindfulness is gone. And so what you do is you just reassert that mindfulness. Maybe you take a deep breath. Maybe you just do a quick body scan. Relax again. Let go of all of those discursive thoughts and return the mindfulness back to the breath. That was, you know, thanks to Jennifer asking that question at the class, at the beginning of the class before we got started. But that gave me an opportunity just to really put in a nutshell this whole teaching that we're talking about. Whether you're a Buddhist or not, it seems to me that's like a pretty reasonable, maybe natural, uh, acceptable way of just looking at our mental processes and how they work. So I wanted to throw it out to you guys and um, answer any questions. I see Jennifer, um, I think you've got a question. Are we supposed to ask questions throughout or save them for the end? Uh, you can ask them throughout because, well, I've been in classes where um, questions were entertained at the end and mostly I just okay. forgot all my questions. Oh, okay. Just so jump. my question for you is, so, okay, if I get knocked off, um, I bring it back to the breath, right? Mm -hmm. The, just, the uh, object of meditation. Yeah. But with wisdom, when I'm either at wisdom or concentration, how do I avoid getting knocked off to begin with? Because anytime I've been like where I get to the meditation is more deeper or there is more concentration, um, I get knocked off. It's like I, like I told you, I'll feel like, oh, wow, this is, I've got it now. This is like meditation is awesome. This is cool. Yeah. This is wonderful. And, and then I get knocked off. not working anymore. Yeah. And so I don't know what yeah. to do. But yeah. I mean, and I, I had teachers tell me that's not the point of meditation is not to get all blissed out or anything like that but um i i anyhow so i don't know what to do yeah there's a there's a couple of things i can say so uh first of all just practice building your mindfulness okay just and it that. will remain operative while your concentration and wisdom is happening. That at least is the perspective, as I understand it, from the concentration and wisdom is happening. If you build on the mindfulness. Yeah. Just keep okay. building that mindfulness. And okay. then you all it's almost like you're making these like mini course corrections, maybe almost even unconsciously as you get more and more familiar. Your mindfulness is always there. And it's okay. always backing you up so that you can dive deeper, you can concentrate onto the object, really engage with it, and then begin to have these realizations, but not let them carry you away, or not no, let the I mean, mind get carried away with them. I'm not sure exactly how to put it. Yeah, okay. And then, so, yeah. I get it. Yeah, and the second kind of uh, question that you asked was, yeah, and definitely in this particular tradition, getting blissed out isn't the point. Yeah. It can happen. And bliss, um, yeah, bliss can arise. I mean, I've had like pretty pleasant meditation sessions. I wouldn't say I'm blissed out, but they say at 
as you get better and better, you get these very powerful states of bliss. I and would assume is, so. Yeah, I would really assume so. Yeah, it and it's it's um, it's expected, but that's not the point. Um, whatever you're the doing, point. whether you're doing single pointed concentration like we do with the breath with one single meditation object or whether you're working through some kind of chain of reasoning or analysis or exploration whichever of those stabilizing meditation or analytical meditation whichever of those that's the point not okay. the feeling of bliss not the feeling of bliss yeah but it's also the point of meditation to learn to be happy and expel my um, negative emotions and, and, and negative habituations at some point, correct? That is Once totally Once I get correct. to that stage, right? Yes. And so um, I guess, I guess I'll say it this way and I'm, I'm leaving this. I mean, we're all um, grown ups here. I'm leaving this yeah. for your own exploration as well and your own experience. Yeah. But yes, definitely. The idea is to reduce your like your negative outlooks, your negative like habits and patterns and so on, understand how your mind works. But it seems to me in reading the literature that it's very possible just to always just focus on the bliss. And like, you know, high level meditators, they say, can achieve this very quickly. And then you know, that's what, that's all they want. They don't want to work okay. on those things that you were mentioning, Jennifer. They just want yeah. to be blissed out. Okay. And so you hear I stories. I can understand that being yeah. it's compelling, natural, right? you know? It's so good. Yeah. It's like drugs almost. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's natural. And then you hear stories of meditators who all they want to do is meditate. And if someone disturbs them, they get angry. Oh yeah. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. So right. maybe that's kind of like evidence that like the getting blissed out isn't necessarily helping you with your anger or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is this, is this making sense to others as well? We're all good. Yeah. Okay. That's the, those are uh, great questions though, Jennifer. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll just mention again, I mean, we had a number of analogies and we can go over them again, if you like, if you, if you find analogies useful. But the one that I'll just touch on tonight, unless there's a request, is the analogy for mindfulness and introspective awareness. If your mindfulness is working, how do you know it's working? Well, the object stays at the center, at the focus of your attention. If that isn't happening, and we can observe this in the next 30 seconds, maybe, maybe next minute, then we use introspective awareness to kind of say, wait a second, I'm not listening to the class tonight. I'm wondering where my dogs are or thinking about what I have to do tomorrow or something like that. And so that happens naturally because we're still just like, we're all beginners here just sort of trying to build up our mindfulness and maybe a few seconds, maybe 10, 15, 20 seconds of mindfulness and then wow, you know. That's when we start to train, we have the opportunity to train our introspective awareness which is detecting and realizing, hey, wait a second, at least for this 30 seconds, I was going to meditate on my breath, but now I'm not. Noticing that and then bringing your attention gently but firmly back to the breath, that is basically introspective awareness. It's like this, a rogue elephant so that's kind of like the mind. I don't know if you've experienced it, but I've certainly experienced my mind going rogue. 
And it's almost like, you know, you're just watching, you know, from outside your body and your mind is like making you do things or say things. And it's like, oh, oh this is not good. So it's like the mind can be like a rogue elephant, you know, smashing down huts and chasing after villagers and everything. And so we're trying to train it. And so that elephant being trained is like the mind. And it's being trained to stay with a sturdy post. That's the meditation object, the breath. How does it stay with the meditation object, the post in this analogy? Through mindfulness. That's like a rope tying the elephant to the post. And if that's happening, that's great. Everything is good. But we know just through experience, just through these past, you know, two plus sessions that, well, our attention, unfortunately, doesn't stay. So we realize that the elephant is getting restive and starting to pull away from the post and maybe looking towards those huts or those villagers with angry eyes. And then that's where introspective awareness comes in, where we goad the elephant back to the post, maybe then strengthen those bonds, you know, the rope of mindfulness to keep the elephant with the post. And it's just like a continual process again and again. But in doing that process, we develop both mindfulness and introspective awareness. That's how we like build up these muscles. So it's not like we're bad meditators. We're actually doing the work. That's the analogy of mindfulness and an analogy for mindfulness and introspective awareness. Using the example of an elephant. So I thought I'd just pause for a second and ask if there's any any more questions about all of these like high level <laughs> concepts that we're talking about. Are we all good so far? Excellent. Stephen, just one thing. Yeah, Susan. Um, the analogy of the elephant tied to the rope seems kind of cruel to me, whereas mindfulness, we're not trying to impose any kind of cruelty or repression on the mind. It's, maybe that's because I'm really sympathetic to elephants. And I, I just think it's terrible the way they're treated. It's... I, you know, when I read that analogy, I think the same thing, Susan. But that's a really important point that you just made, is that you're not trying to, like, I even left out the words that you goad it with the sharp hook of introspective awareness. It's a classical, classical metaphor. But it seems kind of mean. And we don't want to do that. And you'll you'll notice in, in many of the instructions in these meditations that you're not supposed to tighten up. You're not supposed to get frustrated. In fact, how you respond is with an exhalation or an out-breath, relaxing. Because we know these thoughts, they're going to go anyways. They'll pass. They change momentarily from instant to instant. And the only way they actually truly are persistent is if we, in our minds, give them energy, exercise them, bring them back again and again. So the and my favorite analogy is it's like you're holding the hand of a child, a grandchild, something like that, just a little kid, and you're crossing a busy intersection. So you're holding that child's hand gently, you know, you don't want them to scream in pain, but also very firmly holding it to bring it back, bring the child across the intersection or bring the attention back to the breath, the meditation object. 
So that's a really great observation, Susan. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, you know, modify that analogy. Just imagine like just petting the elephant. Say, it's okay, Mr. Elephant. Just, yeah, just go back to the post. Did lots of nice bananas and stuff for you there. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. And we'll just um, continue on a little bit. I think I'll say a little bit about stabilizing and analytical meditation, just to kind of explain the differences slightly, you know, the, di the, the differences between them. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to skip over some of the kind of higher level stuff about the culmination of those two, unless people are interested. Just knowing the difference is pretty useful already. So stabilizing and analytical meditation. Well, do we know what stabilizing meditation is? Well, we've been doing it for the past, uh, you know, since the beginning. And that's basically where all you do is you just try and keep your attention on a single object. So stabilizing the attention through mindfulness on, say, the breath. But that's not the only type of meditation. So we have two very broad categories. And it's said that whatever, in fact, there's like almost numberless variations of meditations. Well, infinite, basically, variations of meditations. But they can be grouped into these two categories, stabilizing and analytical. And all the difference is, really, is either with stabilizing, you just rest on one object like the breath. And in analytical meditation, you're just following a chain of reasoning or associations, chain of logical deduction, something like that. So you're going from object to object. This might be, you know, one of the reasons why you get knocked off of the breath when you're trying to do stabilizing meditation. That reason is because when you start to notice things about the breath, you begin wondering about them. You begin like following chains of reasoning or association, like I said. And then you've stopped doing stabilizing meditation and you've just jumped into analytical meditation. And it's said that analytical meditation is sort of naturally more exciting or more agitating as your mind kind of gets carried away with those thought processes. However, both are necessary for the complete development of the mind. So in general, stabilizing meditation, again, as I described it, and it culminates, its pinnacle is in something called calm abiding. This is just a technical term, if you will. And then there's analytical meditation, which its culmination or its pinnacle is in something called special insight. And you might have heard the word before. Um, the Sanskrit word is vipassana. And that's the particular usage of that Sanskrit term in the Tibetan tradition is analytical meditation taken to its most focused and penetrative and powerful state and yet remaining stable. That great question from Jennifer, you know, just revealed that is, yeah, analysis, but how do you make analysis stable? Well, it's a combination of the two. As you develop and continue to develop your mindfulness it keeps you stable. It culminates in something called calm abiding, where you have this super stable mind that can just calmly abide on whatever meditation object. And then they say you can 
use special insight or vipassana to examine that object. And so really it can be any object, but for Buddhists, it's all kinds of Buddhist topics and realizations and observations and so on. Stephen? Yes. With the um, second meditation that we did last Friday, more analytical than stabilizing or was it still a stabilizing one? Ah, yeah. So yeah, Venerable Sangye Kadro, that was the one on the fundamental nature of the mind, right? Yeah, she gave us, it's tricky to realize directly, you know, I imagine there are people who can just drop into it, but not me. So she kind of gave us sort of a whole logical progression is, okay, well, here's sort of a metaphor, the open sky and clouds moving through the sky. And the clouds are all changing and altering. And then, you know, they just kind of appear and then go away again. They're not, there's not like, like a three-year-old's drawing of the sky. It's not just like a one fluffy cloud that never changes and always stays in that spot. So that would be more analytical. That sort of, and typically guided meditations are like that. Even as I guide you to do stabilizing meditation, I'm seeing different stuff and having you, you know, pay attention to different stuff. So they often appear mixed. So that's a great question, Jean. Did, did that cover what you were wanting to know? Uh, Jennifer. So you um, debate or analyze all different topics with Vipassana, right? Death, emptiness, all these things, karma, you go over all these things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Those are like, yeah, those are classical Buddhist. You go over all, like all the reasonings and kind of, um, when yeah. do we start d doing that? Um, like, when do do they do that in the some of the courses in um, at the at where you guys are from? Do they start setting yeah. us up with some vipassana meditations and stuff? Because I've never, I've never had one before, so that's why I'm every, asking. Every every teaching. Oh, okay. So every they, teaching, they bring it. You know. Okay. You know, me kind of a my very humble level teaching yeah. or, you know, the senior students, the, the teachers, the ordained, you know, yeah. every teaching okay. turns into a meditation. Oh, okay. And my last question is, um, what is a deity sadhana considered? Is that considered Vipassana or no? So I'm, you know, I I won't talk about um, any kind of uh, uh, tantra. That's that? sort of like oh, that's tantra. I didn't know that was tantra. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, typically it is. There are kind of oh, like exceptions. Okay. I'm doing closed sadhanas though. I'm not doing the open ones. They're closed. So I mean, they're open a, teachings. Yeah, that is a topic for to ask advanced practitioners. You know, oh, I miss. I actually misspoke. So I misspoke. The yeah. ones that I'm doing are are all open teachings. They're not closed. Teachings. Okay. Okay. I misspoke. So, I said it backwards by accident. Yeah. So here's what I heard. I heard this from Geshe Sopa, who is coming back to the center uh, yeah. in a week or two, and he's a great person. I mean, he's like extremely high level. So if you've got, if you want, like really good answers you can pose questions to him but what he said is that when you're doing complex visualizations like that okay and these are visualizations of the deities you know even of their mandalas you know the the yeah. kind of places they live in all of the symbolic things that they're doing you know like their mudras the, the way they're yeah. holding their hands all of their implements mm -hmm. their clothing all of the features of their body um you may be going through all of those as part of the sadhana yeah and how it works is he explained it is it's mindfulness because it's not analytical it's mindfulness it's a visualization of a very complex image 
And what you do is you like, you focus on one aspect of it until that is like very clear and very solid with mindfulness, with stabilizing meditation. And then you go oh, to the so next So those are one. stabilizing. Say that you again. Stabilize. So you go from one part of the focus exactly. to the next. Yeah. Or if you're going through a certain sadhana or a certain ceremony or, you know, procedure, if you will, each at each point, you're engaging with that procedure, you know, a particular mantra and then certain prayers and so on. You're engaging with full mindfulness just of that. Okay. That's how... Sorry. That's how I understood he explained it, but it's they better to ask, sure. yeah, it's better to ask, you know, ordained or, you know, high level practitioners that you, you know, that you've gotten to know and you really trust and you have faith in. Okay. So in general, um, we probably, you know, maybe before we came to this course, we just thought, that it was just stabilizing meditation. That's what you do in meditation is why well, you do nothing, right? Just completely shut down the mind, which we're finding, in fact, the opposite may appear to happen. And so this is kind of what we Westerners might have, you know, a preconception about. But um, analytical meditation typically is less well known and it just involves like formal reasonings internal debates you know maybe similar to the debates carried on by the tibetan monks in their debating courtyards so they have in, in their monasteries they have like courtyards where they you know they debate all of these topics here to get more familiar with them and then they can meditate on them so that's the difference between the two but we do this we you know we do this ourselves all the time so I might be focused on one thing like the breath, or we might be going through a chain of reasoning. So that's the difference between stabilizing and, um, and analytical meditation. And I just touched on this a little bit. I'll say a few more words. I said that any teaching can be a meditation. Well, that's how you familiarize yourself with something you've just heard heard, seen, read, is you bring it back in your memory and you step through it. You say, oh, how, does, how do these things that I just learned relate? How do they relate to other things that I've already learned? You know, oh, what about this? You know, the teacher didn't say anything about that. I wonder how that works. So in the process of learning, in the Buddhist formulation of it, we begin with learning and then contemplation, which you can sort of think of as an analytical meditation, and then mindfulness meditation. It's a fundamental progression to really understand and imprint that knowledge. So first through learning, that is hearing, reading, seeing, you become exposed to a topic. Second, through repeated reasoning, maybe analytical meditation, recollection, you understand and familiarize yourself with the topic. Finally, when you're very familiar with the topic, you bring it to your mind in meditation, dwelling on its essence, just the feeling, kind of like what we do at the end of each session after our dedication. I don't know if you guys remember, but at the end, when we dedicate, we think about and recollect and recall and analyze everything that we learned during the, during the class, the benefits it brought, the insights it brought. And then once we've done that, become familiar with it, then we just sort of rest in that kind of feeling of rejoicing that, yeah, I did all this work on myself and lasted through the whole class and learned all these things. And then that cements the kind of the feeling in your memory. And so that would be stabilizing or just mindfulness meditation, where it's just that sort of the whole gestalt, the feeling, just, just integrating it all. 
So that's the Buddhist view. But to me, it seems like, I mean, I don't know, it seems pretty plausible that anyone could maybe make use of that. So let's have a quick five minute break. I'll start um, and then we'll return for a meditation. I'll, I'll just start a clock. I'll put it on the screen. And just relax a little bit, play with your dogs, pet your dogs, have a glass of water. Just don't look at a device. All right, welcome back everyone, including the animals. Well, with uh, the instruction we've had just now, we'll return back to the mindfulness of breathing with relaxation. And again, you know, if it gets too distracting, all of the concepts and ideas and perspectives that um, we've been exposed to, always just return to the breath and just enjoy your meditation. But as I said before the break, like a wild elephant, uh, the untamed mind can inflict enormous damage on ourselves and those around us. In addition to going back and forth between what you could call attention deficit, that is dullness, you know, sinking, zoning out, and hyperactivity, it's like agitation, overstimulation, in between those two, going back and forth, the normal untrained mind compulsively disgorges a toxic stream of wandering thoughts and then latches onto them obsessively, carried away by one story or another. So this impacts all of us every day and our normal mind is prone to these imbalances, the imbalance between attention deficit and hyperactivity. And that's why we experience so much mental distress. And they say in this particular tradition that such disturbances are symptoms of an unbalanced mind. So here we're gonna revisit the mindfulness of breathing with relaxation just to review, and you can do this own internal review during this meditation. So while maintaining relaxation, stability, and attentiveness, you recall those are the three physical characteristics that we establish. And then cue the analogous, the, the similar mental characteristics in our mind. So while maintaining those in our meditation posture and in our mind, can we notice mindfulness? That is our ability to stay on a particular object of our choice. Can we notice concentration once we've engaged with the object after becoming mindful of it? And can we notice wisdom, that is, having observations or realizations, discoveries about the object? Can we notice that happening? And when our attention inevitably goes off the meditation object, do we notice ourselves employing introspective awareness? which is really just as simple as saying, I'm not meditating on the breath anymore. I better go back to that. 
See also if you can notice the mental hindrances of distraction, sometimes called excitement, or dullness, sometimes called laxity. Maybe you'll only no notice one or the other, might be familiar, or maybe you'll notice both at the same time being distracted, but also like not having a lot of energy in the mind. See if those arise for you. And it kind of is an advanced practice. See if you can just notice the transient nature of our thoughts, the way they're they arise and subside. They may just come up out of nowhere seemingly and the way they change and then the way they disappear in particular when we don't give them any energy or attention, the way they're just gone. And of course, as I said at the top, if you find all this too distracting, just return to the breath, watching it, or counting it to have an anchor. So take your meditation posture. Being at ease, being still, being vigilant. Settle your body with those three qualities and take some slow, gentle, deep breaths, breathing in and out through the nostrils. Again, since we just had a break, do a body scan. Let your awareness permeate your entire body as you do so, just so you can become present with the breath. And notice if in becoming present, you also become relaxed. Now settle your respiration in its natural flow. Continue breathing through your nostrils, noting the sensations of the respiration wherever they arise within your body. Don't impose any rhythm on your breathing. Just attend closely to the respiration, but without willfully influencing it in any way. Thoughts are bound to arise involuntarily, and your attention might also be pulled away by noises or movement. When you note that you've become distracted, through your own introspective awareness. 
instead of tightening up and forcing your attention back to the breath, try this. Just simply let go of those thoughts and distractions. Remove your attention and mental energy from those distractions and they will naturally vanish. Especially with each out breath, relax your body, release extraneous thoughts, and happily let your attention settle back into the body. Again and again, Counteract the agitation and turbulence of the mind by relaxing more deeply, not by contracting your body or mind. With each exhalation, release involuntary thoughts as if they were dry leaves blown away by a soft breeze. Relax deeply through the entire course of the exhalation and continue to relax as the next breath flows in smoothly like the tide. Breathe so smoothly that you feel as if your body were being breathed by the air surrounding you. That completes the meditation. Now, did anyone notice anything different from the last time we tried that? Any observations? Yes, I noticed something. Um, mm. it, it helped me a lot when you said instead of trying to bring the attention back to the breath, just, just let it go. Let go the mental energy on whatever distraction came into our mind, just let it go. And then like leaves blowing away, that was very helpful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, that's a great image, isn't it? Thanks for mentioning that, Susan. Yeah, and so you can, it depends on how it's going for you and what works. You can just bring the attention back. Sometimes if you're already pretty calm and you've just sort of naturally drifted off, just bring the attention back. But if you're bedeviled by certain, you know, extraneous thoughts, habit patterns, and so on, again, that's the beauty of introspective awareness. It's introspection. You know what works for you. And so you say, oh, maybe if I just like take the energy away, I mean, in a sense, you're just giving those distractions a little bit of respect and then saying, okay, you can go now. 
So that's a great observation. Anyone else wanted to say anything? Yeah, I would. Jay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, one of the things I recognized in this meditation is that I grew up in a culture which did not encourage deep introspection on many levels, right? And I can remember my mother saying when I was quite young, like pre-adolescent probably, that I thought too much. So that we're trying to, you know, because I should be busy and happy like everybody else. Um, so I find that um, the ability to be able to hear things again and again is really helpful for me because it's dramatically different than what I would have been inculcated with as a child about how the world yeah. works. So that's very valuable for me and I really appreciate it. So I just wanted to- Oh, of course, you're, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and we might not be familiar with this. This is, you know, can be a very like strange perspective, you know, compared to many outlooks. So it's good to do that, even just even if you naturally tend towards it, actually hearing it again and again can be really helpful because, you know, over time you develop associations and kind of real, you know, realizations, observations and so on. And then when you hear it again, it's like, oh, that's what that means. Absolutely. Absolutely. The penny drops. Yeah. Part of it, though, yeah. is... And this might seem strange in meditation, but we're doing actually kind of like a very structured meditation. We have particular qualities we establish in the body that cue particular qualities in the mind. And then we have like all of these mental factors and processes happening and everything. And that's that can be a bit reductive I mean, you really have to slow down and sort of think about it to say, oh yeah, that's, I think that could be how my mind works. But the whole point of this approach is to prevent what Jennifer brought up earlier is like just blissing out, which is a great feeling, but how does that help us off the cushion or just zoning out? So just like, you know, just turning your brain off or getting caught up in ruminative thoughts, repeating again and again those like negative, you know, entrapping mental patterns and habits and so on. I, I think that's kind of one of the key aspects of this particular approach is that it, it is a deliberate practice. And I would say also, um... For me, it's not exactly bliss, but what I guess pulls me back to the cushion is uh, it does open up my heart. And then when compassion flows, that is the state of mind I prefer to be in. And it seems rather close to this a little bit in the direction of bliss, if you know what I'm saying. But it's just yeah. generally an open heartedness, yeah. um, which I very much value that. Uh, of course, you, you yeah. know, and it's almost like when you can kind of dispense with all of our delusions and all of our afflictions, and those are, Bud that's Buddhist terminology, but, you know, they're pretty similar for all of us, like whether it's anger or, you know, attachment to things. When I say attachment, I mean like strings attached, attachment. Did that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. With like expectations and, oh, I'm attached to you. So you need to behave in a certain way and don't change for my needs. That's that's kind of what attachment means here. It doesn't mean it's different from, you know, having loving kindness for someone else, but still letting them be who they are. So, yeah. And so... What's interesting, where I'm going with a lot of words, is just that it seems like when you can calm the mind and dispense with, you know, sort of these negative thought patterns and so on, it sort of brings a sort of a natural 
kind of just calmness, happiness, you know, just, you know, not like bliss, but just being good with stuff. I don't know. <laughs> that's, I, that's maybe not a very good explanation, but it's kind of, yeah, that's what I've noticed. So thanks for saying that, Jay. Stephen. Yes. Um, okay, here's an odd question. Is it possible that thoughts wouldn't arise during a during a guided meditation like this, but that you actually could just be focusing on the breath? Or am I being seriously deluded? Am I no, am I self-delusional? <laughs> It's like, as you sort of like drill down, it gets more and more subtle, you know, when you're thinking about thinking and like, is well, like, what exactly is a thought? Um, when we looked at the fundamental nature of the mind, we said that it was clear and knowing or clear and luminous last session. And what's always there is some kind of perception. Certain traditions say that you can actually halt. I think, and I, I'm not even clear on this, but there are certain like cessations where you can just like halt all mental activity. I'm not sure, you know, I've never experienced that myself, at least not voluntarily. <laughs> And, and I'm not 100% sure whether it's like just halting all mental activity or just sort of like ideation, conceptuality, and just like being with perception, like perceiving the breath. So I think for your, your question is like a deep, deep one, Gene. I think it's possible just to be in sort of... Um, like just kind of in a perception, a perceptive mode where you're just like feeling the sensations of the breath and then just leaving them there. There's no kind of conception, you know, concepts, ideation, thinking, this is my breath. I'm doing really well in this meditation. My breath is getting, getting subtler and subtler. So in that sense, you can definitely reduce the conceptuality in your mind and just sort of bring it to pure sensation, maybe. Did, did that kind of come close to your, your question, Jean? Um, I guess, I just, like I, I noticed that the second meditation we did last Friday, mm -hmm. I very definitely was thinking different things. And, and so I was listening to your words and trying to let it go, you know, but, but the, the two that we did tonight, it didn't even, you know, there's stuff going on in the house and it didn't even seem like I was, it seemed like it was happening naturally, which was very odd that I wasn't like, Oh crap, I'm hearing a TV program or, Oh, the dog is, you know, doing stuff. It was just, oh, yeah, okay. Just breathing and just happily breathing, and no thoughts were coming up that I needed to release. But then I thought afterwards, well, maybe I was doing it wrong then if, if I wasn't having thoughts. No, I think it sounds to me like you were doing it right, of course. And that's sort of then, you know, the natural effect of meditating mindfully so if that's the case if that's what was happening in your mind by meditating mindfully all of like your sensory inputs just sort of drop off and they become dimmer and dimmer yeah and even when they do kind of reach the threshold where you sort of notice them your mindfulness keeps you on that object and so you're not distracted by them remember that mindfulness is First of all, it keeps, it keeps, it puts the attention on the object, but it also resists distraction. And those can sound like, you know, the same things. But I think you just gave an example of how they're different, although closely related. 
And so, I mean, and that's really great. And so, yeah, I wouldn't, you know, because discursive thoughts or distractions didn't arise, that's good. Um, and that's like an interesting observation as well. Well, I guess it's coming up because I've been listening to the things that you've been saying. And I was thinking about your description of wisdom um, as the sort of third, you know, third, mm. third stage in a, in a, in a process um, and thinking, but all those noticing all those qualities about the object isn't that thought? Isn't that thinking? So do you have to let go? The moment you think, oh, my breath is deepening, must you then immediately release release that thought? Because it's a thought and that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. I guess I that was yeah. I was just a little unclear on that. Yeah. And and that's what you do is you release that thought. You don't follow it. You know, oh, my breath is deepening. Oh, it's that happened, you know faster than last time, you know, you just kind of, it'll, it'll return in your memory, possibly. And that's what they say can happen. Um, I won't give like, I won't get the whole explanation there, but you'll have like a remembering consciousness later where you say, oh yeah, my breath got really subtle. Just as an example, my breath was deepening and my breath got really subtle. And I had to really fine tune my attention and my mindfulness because it got hard to notice. And then my in, my attention kind of became more fine tuned. And I was staying with the even the subtler breath. And so those things can happen. But then, as like you say, Jean, that's you know exemplary is you just don't be in single pointed stabilizing meditation you just don't yeah you don't superimpose you don't elaborate on any of those observations all right um any other questions and i think um jay if you want to put that in like a group chat you can go ahead and do that yep okay dokie yeah jay has a um a reference that she thinks will be helpful to the rest of the group. Did anyone else want to, and so that'll show up in the chat. Did anyone else have anything to say? Okay. So just in general, to say about Thoughts that are arising, you know, like Jean asked. Contrary to most people's perception of mindfulness practice as a way to stop thinking, through mindfulness and introspection, we actually become more aware of the presence of thoughts. And while we try and minimize the ability, the strength of those thoughts to take our attention away from the breath or whatever meditation object. We do notice them and we can learn from them. And what we learn to discern be is between different types of thought processes that we're having. So like what Jean brought up, that's like really interesting and educational learning about your mind and how your mind thinks. And those are quite subtle observations that I'm not sure of it. I think it's pretty exceptional that we're able even to access that. So we discern between different types of thought processes, for example, functional and useful thought processes, learning about the way our mind works versus thinking that is dysfunctional and maladaptive. So for example, when I say functional thinking, it might be exactly that. 
is, okay, what's going on in the meditation? What should I do next? Should I follow that thought, that discursive thought of wanting to, you know, say I noticed that my meditation, in my meditation, my breath got deeper. Should I follow that discursive thought or not? So that's functional thinking. And if you're doing stabilizing meditation, you say, no, I'll let it, I'll let it go and I'll continue to experience the breath. And maybe other things will reveal themselves to me as well. And then there's dysfunctional thinking, which tends to be involuntary and habitual. And we might have learned these through our reactive habits to things that have happened in our lives. You know, we might have had traumas or conflicts or whatever. And we develop patterns and habits in order to mitigate them. Even if the situation isn't there, the habit remains. And an example of that is when we start to get distressed and worried over some kind of imaginary outcome in the future. And it's these involuntary dysfunctional thoughts that are what keeps us stressed out, unable to rest or sleep, and kind of sustains the agitation and tension in our body and mind. So first of all, just noticing and discriminating in between the two is important. And that happens through introspective awareness. And we can acknowledge the fact that our attention was drawn into such thinking, in particular compulsive involuntary thoughts. And what we can do is what Susan pointed out, and that's just using the natural outbreath to give us an excellent opportunity to practice letting go of such thinking. The outbreath is a physical expelling of carbon dioxide, waste gas. And in the same way, we're kind of expelling those negative, compulsive, involuntary thoughts. They may, of course, return being compulsive and involuntary. But over time, we gradually short circuit that habit. And as soon as we notice that a compulsive and involuntary thought begins to come up, we know exactly what to do to short circuit it. And that might be just the natural out-breath that gives us an excellent op opportunity to let go of those thoughts. And we can even reinforce this idea by just having a little phrase or even a word to remind ourselves to sort of substitute the habit with another action. So the word or short phrase could be something like release when we notice compulsive involuntary thought. And then we know, breathe out. That physical activity cues a kind of disengagement from the involuntary and compulsive thought. And over time, again and again, we sort of de-energize that habit. And we know we develop a habit of how to deal with it. So this is one way that the cultivation of mindfulness in stabilizing meditation can benefit us, even in our early stages of practice. So when we nurture a mindful focus on a specific object of meditation, such as the bodily sensations in the body scan, or the breath sensations in particular, 
um, on, on the upper lip or in the nostrils. When we begin with that, and then practice releasing unnecessary physical tensions and calming our mental agitation, as we learn to do at the beginning of any meditation, it helps also release compulsive involuntary thinking. How? When our mind is calmed, we can notice the compulsive involuntary thinking and we have a routine to substitute for following those compulsive involuntary thoughts. Instead of elaborating and superimposing more and more thoughts, we know we just breathe out and return our attention to the breath. Well, I thought I would end here tonight, if that's all right. And I think Jay may have put some useful links in the chat, but I wanted to just stop and ask if there were any more questions before we finish up with a dedication. No, I don't have any questions. And uh, I really like the way you explained that. Involuntary compulsive dysfunctional thoughts give energy to habits, bad habits, agitations. They give energy, so release them. That's so beautifully worded. I mean, it, it just goes right to my understanding. So I really appreciate that. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. If there's nothing else that anyone wants to say, thanks very much for coming by tonight. Thank you. So we'll just end up with a little dedication here where we take the energy, kind of the, the hard work that all of you guys did tonight by meditating and thinking about um, what I've said, observing things in your mind that you may never have observed before. It's kind of amazing, actually. So we take that, it's considered like a substance. And we dedicate it for something that, um, you know, will come to, will ripen to benefit us, but also to benefit those around us as well. Maybe through this attentional training, by calming our mind, by becoming more aware of our habits and so on, our compulsions. So let's take that and dedicate it this way. From the 10th chapter, the dedication chapter of Shanti Deva's Bodhiacharya Avatara the way of the Bodhisattva. For as long as space endures, and for as long as living beings remain, until then may I too abide to dispel the misery of the world. All right. Thank you very much. See you next week. Last class next week. And Jean, have a great time. I understand that you won't be able to make it. Thanks so much, Stephen. Thank you and good night, everybody. Good night, Good night, Susan. Good night, Jennifer. Good night, Rachel. Good night, Jay. Stephen, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Cool. Um, so I wanted to uh, tell you that I have tried the two minutes of meditation break, two minutes meditation break, as you suggested. And I found that I am able to find mindfulness in doing this. So I was wondering, once I feel some stability, um, and I'm ready to move on, do I add more two minute sessions, I'm doing about eight two minute sessions, mm -hmm. should I add more two minute sessions? Or should I add another minute and make it three minutes? What do you think I should do? Those are the only two options, right? Or is there another option? Yeah, um, I think, well, okay, so I'll kind of answer it one way, first of all. I think you've already done what you need to do by thinking about the options and knowing that they're there. Okay. So you've got like tools in your toolbox. 
You can okay. continue on like adding more and more short sessions. Okay. Or you can lengthen the session, see how it works for you. Okay. Right? Probably so either way is what you're saying? I'm saying either way, I'm saying I don't know because it's going to depend on you. Okay. But those are both valid. I mean, you've already got it figured out. Those are both valid ways of approaching it. I just wanted to thank you because I feel like I'm finally cracking the code. Oh, that's right? great. That's great. Yeah. There's other I'm, greater meditation I, teachers, but I'm glad I'm, I could. I'm finally getting mindfulness like yeah. in a real way. It's I have like six days or so worth of or five days. Oh, since amazing. I had, yeah. Yeah. That's really and amazing. It's worth the meditation and I'm actually getting the mindfulness and I can't even believe it. It's like, I'm so yeah. happy about this. Oh, that's wonderful. And so thank really you. all it. Yeah. I think, yeah. Susan is giving you thumbs up as well. Yeah. All it comes it's down versus to. Versus spacing out. Cause I was spacing yeah. out. Yeah. All it and comes just down. Just finding mindfulness out of sure. the blue sometimes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The way it works is that you're getting yourself familiar with correct, you know, effective mindfulness. Doesn't matter how long or, you know, how short, how many times, lengthening it, increasing the number. You're paying attention to the mindfulness and you're building up the associations in your brain. You're making a mindfulness habit, basically. That's I know I'm noticing that yeah. I'm afraid to even talk about it because I'm afraid it's going to stop, you know? Well, you know, there's, there might be times things will come up in your life, yeah. you know, th you know, things will improve, you know how it is. And maybe you'll plateau, maybe something will happen just like anything in life. And yeah, not so mindful anymore, but you still have that in your, you can still go back to just two minutes or 30 yeah. seconds, you know, over two minutes. Yeah. So you, you've got like all of the tools in the toolkit. It cool. sounds like you're a crafts person. So I'm pretty confident you can use those tools pretty well. Cool. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Have a good night. You too.